In the early 5th century, the first known Christian missionaries set foot on the shores of Ireland. Their arrival came alongside a period of disruption in the politics of Western Europe. In neighbouring Britain, the power of the Roman Empire, which had ruled most of what is now Wales and England for over three centuries, had collapsed in two, just two decades earlier. And in wider Europe, what was little known of the place referred to as Hibernia came from accounts already hundreds of years old. Even in these writings, its peoples were little known to classical authors of Greek and Rome. Most were content to describe them as cannibals and barbarians, dwelling in what they presumed to be the frozen edges of the habitable world. But this island was a far cry from that known to its neighbours, and that the earliest Christian missionaries would have encountered. According to later accounts dating from the medieval period, then the society they entered was one that resembled those of ancient Gaul and Britain and was separated into patchwork tribes ruled over by pagan kings. If we believe these texts, then these rulers dwelled in grand palaces and halls frequented by poets and bards, and took to the fields in chariots resembling those of heroes of the Trojan War. For centuries these missionaries would struggle to convert these rulers, and in doing so, early Christ church documents claim that they faced many trials and opponents. Chief amongst these were the custodians of ritual life amongst the pagan Irish. It was this group, we are told, that had survived the disappearance of their brethren elsewhere in northwestern Europe, and that continued to hold a prestigious role amongst Irish society as prophets, judges, and teachers to the sons of kings. Across a vast body of surviving literature, these figures are presented as wielders of powerful magics and as worshippers of a unique pantheon of gods and goddesses who grant a sovereignty to mortal kings. Despite the efforts of the church, this group would persist in Ireland long after the arrival of its earliest missionaries, only gradually giving way to the spread of this new faith. Eventually, however, they too lose their prestigious role being relegated to the fringes of society. And soon, after the last vestiges of the Druids, would be gone. In the year of Akarta, August Fawcett arrived at Aaron Tashpansha. It's Misha Shonatuma and Shanaki Aaron Tashpansha, and I'd like to bid you welcome to this video. If you like this video and other videos, I would like to ask you to go to the About page and go to Buy Me a Coffee if you wish to donate. Everything is appreciated. Gormak. In our last video, we looked at Irish mythology. So now we're looking what archaeology of the Precursor has to say. Well, to provide some clarity, we need to conduct an investigation into its major features and compare it to the society depicted in Irish mythology. For this examination, we will focus on the Iron Age, the archaeological period which, according to later Irish chronicles, mostly overlaps with the events of the Ulster Cycle and also roughly corresponds with the production of the classical reports of the Druids in neighbouring Britain and Gaul. In Ireland, the Iron Age is held to have lasted for longer than elsewhere in Western Europe, beginning between roughly 600 to 500 BC and continuing until around the end of the 4th century AD. Unfortunately for us, much of this time is marked by a paucity of archaeological evidence for domestic settlements. The excavation, which could potentially provide more insight into the structure of contemporary society. We do know that for the first centuries of this period, we see evidence that the population was increasing, as shown by the appearance of new farmland in previously forested areas. Then around 200 BC, there appears to be a major change in Irish society, and perhaps brought on by increased environmental stress. For roughly the next four centuries, we see an increase in forested area across Ireland, from 40 BC to 250 AD. Evidence collapses for the use of oak, the most common building material of the period. This apparent drop in population and settlement has led to this period being dubbed as the Irish Dark Age, though more re recent research has demonstrated that the picture is more complicated. While the clearing of land may have reduced, there is still evidence for the production of cereals throughout this period, 
along with the introduction of new agricultural technologies such as the beehive kern. Ironworking also appears in Ireland during this time, though the actual number of early iron items such as axe heads, spears and swords have been excavated remains low. Around this time, items also begin to display the distinctive swirls and spiral motifs of the Latin art style, which was common throughout the Northern and Western Europe during this time, as do many items of personal ornamentation made from bronze. Finally, the building of wooden tracks and causeways across bogs and marshy ground also continued from the preceding Bronze Age and Neolithic. This includes the famous Corlea Trackway, which is a 20 km long wooden road unearthed by Professor Barry Rafferty and his team in the 1980s, the timbers of which have been radiocarbon dated to 148 BC. So how much does this society and that of the early medieval period compare with the one it's seen in Irish mythology? Well, before we answer this, we should note that there are indeed many societal features that are shared between these two periods. For example, most of Ireland's major domesticated animals and crops have been present since the arrival of Neolithic farmers between the late 4th and early 3rd millennium BC, and metal weaponry such as swords and spears were introduced in the succeeding Bronze Age. This means that it can often be difficult to narrow down a particular element to a specific time. However, there are a few societal features that are known to differ significantly between the two periods. Let's begin with domestic life. In the tales of the Ulster Cycle, much of the population occupies fortified sites, often referred to as dunes or cars. These sites are usually described as consistent of buildings contained within a large enclosure, circled as many as three or more earthen ramparts separated by ditches, and that were used to contain a large number of livestock. Some tales, such as the Tain Bo Cooley, also mention the presence of a wooden palisade that presumably was used to augment the existing rampart. When we examine the small number of domestic sites that we found dating to the Iron Age, however, we see little resemblance to these depictions. Instead, most sites of the spirit consist of small collections of circular roundhouses, huts and hearts. According to the archaeologists J.P. Mallory and John Waddle, there is also increasing evidence that a number of small ringed enclosures were constructed during this period and may have been, in some cases been used for domestic occupation. Outside of these sites, there is also evidence of linear earthworks dotted throughout the Irish landscape dating from this time which consists of banks, ditches, and sometimes palisades. The exact function of these earthworks is, de is still debated, but common hypotheses are that they comprise some form of border between tribal territories or act as, as a defensive barrier to guard livestock. Instead, the closest parallel to the dwellings described in Irish mythology is the archaeological feature of the Irish ring fort. These sites are usually marked by a circular enclosure measuring between 28 to 35 metres in diameter, contained within two or more earthen ramparts. These enclosures are taught to house prosperous farmers and elites and would have acted as secure locations to guard their livestock. However, while some of these sites may have constructed in the late Iron Age, evidence for their use does not become prevalent until the 6th and 7th centuries AD, placing their heyday well within the early medieval period. This lack of resemblance between the Society of Irish Mythology and that of the Iron Age continues when we examine contemporary weaponry. In Irish mythology, swords are frequently described as large slashing weapons, easily capable of decapitating a man. However, the few examples of Iron Age swords that have been unearthed bear little similarity to the depictions. As John Waddle notes in his work, The Prehistoric Archaeology of Ireland, in many cases, these blades are closer to long daggers than swords, possessing blades that range in length from as much as 46 centimetres to as little as 29 centimetres. In theory, these weapons could still be used in close combat as stabbing implements, but in function, they little resemble the slashing blades of the Ulster Cycle. Instead, these depictions are far closer to the large slashing swords that appear to have been introduced in during the medieval and Viking period. Exactly why short blades were introduced at all, however, is difficult to explain. Longer blades were produced during the preceding Bronze Age, and there seems to be no practical reason that could limit the forging of these swords in iron. One theory is that these weapons could have been designed more for display than for decapitating opponents, and the presence of a decorative Latin elements in their hills presents some supporting evidence for this theory. Outside of swords, another distinctive feature of warfare in the text of the Ulster Cycle is the chariot, which is used by its heroes in both battle and simply as a form of transport. 
In form, these vehicles are often described as similar to those that have been found in elite Iron Age burials in both Britain and Northern France, which usually comprise of lightweight, two-wheeled vehicles drawn by a team of two horses. Similar vehicles are also known to have been encountered by Caesar during his expeditions to Britain, where he describes them as being used in warfare as mobile platforms from which missiles could be hurled. When it comes to use of chariots being widespread in Iron Age Ireland, however, the evidence is unclear. We know that horse bits are a common item in the archaeological record during this time, and some finds the two sets of bits together have been interpreted as a sign of its team driving a vehicle. When it comes to vehicles themselves, however, we have only a few lucky finds to interpret. Unlike in Britain and France, we see no evidence for chariot burials in Ireland and the evidence here is limited to a small number of wooden parts, along with metal fittings, that might have ornamented such a vehicle. These include a small number of disc wheels dating from the 5th and 4th centuries BC, along with a pair of lock wheels unearthed at Dugarry Moor that date from the late Bronze Age. It is possible that some of these wheels may have belonged to chariots, instead of simple wagons and carts, but with the evidence available we cannot say this with any degree of certainty. In more concrete terms, we can say that there is slightly more evidence for the use of chariots in the succeeding early medieval period, where vehicles matching the descriptions are depicted in artwork, and where they are occasionally referenced to contemporary law codes and chronicles. So if the weaponry, transport and settlement patterns depicted in Irish mythology bear only a limited resemblance to those known to have existed during the Iron Age, where else were we look to verify its depiction of pre-Christian society? Well, another useful comparison can be made with the known animal life of this period. As noted by J.P. Mallory in his work, In Search of the Irish Dreamtime, the fauna of Ireland is significantly less time-dependent than the human-built environment. As we mentioned before, major domesticated animals such as sheep, pigs, dogs and cattle have been present in Ireland since at least the Neolithic, and there is evidence that others such as horses, goats and cats were all present by the late prehistory. The picture is the same for a majority of Ireland's wildlife, and many of the mammals and birds described in Irish mythology are native to its shores. On detailed scrutiny, however, Irish mythology does not does contain some animals which we currently have no evidence for being pre present in Iron Age Ireland. For example, domesticated fowls such as chicken and geese are occasionally mentioned in these texts, but their physical remains are only attested during the early medieval period. There are also some examples of wildlife that are occasionally mentioned for which remains are elusive and well into the medieval period, such as the squirrel and the hedgehog. A more ergorious example can be found in the occasional appearance of snakes within its tails, which despite the famous tale of Patrick expelling from Ireland, never appear to be present in the shores in the first place. In addition to more conventional creatures, more outlandish creatures also make appearances in various texts such as tigers, lions, bears and the lynx, all of which were never present in Ireland, or in the case of the lynx and bear appear to have gone extinct by the Iron Age. So at the end of our examination, we can conclude that the major archaeological features of the Irish Iron Age have only a small amount in common with the depiction of pagan society found in the Irish mythological change. Sorry, in the Irish mythological cycles. Indeed, the picture given in these tales of a warrior elite replete with chariots and warring kings dwelling in fortresses, seems only to have a limited basis in the actual prehistory. In fact, outside of a number of items of personal ornamentation that have been found dating from the period, the Iron Age is marked, marked by little conspicuous evidence for the existence of major elite groups. For the most, we can say that between the presence of the linear earthworks and the accounts of classical authors, is that Ireland may have been split into tribes ruled by over by minor chieftains during this period between which occasional conflicts over territory and livestock may will, well have arisen. Overall, we must conclude that, as argued by more rev revisionist authors, the description of pre-Christian society as seen in Irish mythology bears a greater resemblance to that of the early medieval period. So what does this mean for the Druids? Well, if the society they claim to have exist, it appears in more be based in a later period rather than the entirely pagan elements, then it does cast a degree of doubt over any role attributed to these figures in the Irish mythological cycles. So when it comes to any ritual role attributed to the Druids, we have so far left out the most visible piece of the archaeological puzzle. 
For while evidence of domestic sites during this period is limited, we have at our disposal a veritable overabundance of ceremonial sites. Dating from this time, many of them are built on a scale unmatched elsewhere in northwestern Europe. We should note that the ritual features identified within both the Ulster Cycle and wider Irish mythology are known to date from across many different periods of Irish prehistory. As such, let us indulge in a quick summary of Irish ritual developments preceding the Iron Age. In Ireland, monumental building is known to date back to Neolithic, and many of its ritual features draw strong similarities to those found in neighbouring Britain and France. The earliest of these structures consist of various forms of megalithic tombs which date back to the late 4th millennium BC, with prominent examples being found in sites such as Carrochiel, Carrimore and Loch Crew. The most famous of these are known as the passage tombs, large earthen or stone mounds that cover an internal burial chamber assessed through a narrow passage in Ireland. The most spectacular examples of these have been found at Brun Boyne or the Boyne Valley tombs. These include the complexes of Nout and Doubt along the gigantic structure of Newgrange. This tomb, which dates from around 3200 BC, underwent a major reconstruction during the 1960s and 70s, results which have proven controversial amongst archaeologists. Much like the later construction of Stonehenge in neighbouring Britain, the central passageway of both Newgrange and many other passage tombs are aligned to significant astronomical events such as the summer and winter solstices. In Irish mythology, these passage graves occasionally appear under the names of the Sheen and were taught to act as portals to the Irish underworld, Tiernan and Oak, which stood open on significant dates and allowed their otherworldly Densians to interact with mortals. Later in the Neolithic, we also see other types of monuments appear, such as circular ditched and banked structures known as hinges, along with both stone and wooden circles. Many of these structures will continue to be used throughout the early Bronze Age, and while Ireland is held to run roughly to the mid-3rd millennium BC through to the 6th century BC. In addition, this new monumental burial structure would also emerge, including earth and burial mounds such as barrows, which may have occasionally been identified with the Shi. When we covered in our early video in the Druids in the second half of the 2nd millennium BC, the ritual practices of northwestern Europe uh, have gotten, gone a major shift. As in neighbouring Britain, ritual behaviour seems to move away from the construction of new megalithic sites in favour of ritual feasting, along with the, the deposition of votive hoards containing high prestige metal items, either underground or in watery places such as springs, rivers and bogs. It is around the 2nd and 1st centuries BC, however, that ritual architecture in Ireland seems to have diverged dramatically from that of its neighbours. While in Britain we see evidence of smaller ceremonial enclosures being constructed, in Ireland we see a resurgence in the building of monumental earthworks with no clear parallel elsewhere in Europe. This construction is best seen in the most visible sites of the period, which are often referred to as the Royal Centres of Ireland. One of the major centres, for now are thought to have uh, unambiguously date from either the Iron Age or earlier, those of Aimaca or Navenfort, Rack Crocon, Dun Elaine and Tara, or better known as the Hill of Tara. These same sites are also mentioned as great pre-Christian centres. In a 9th century calendar of saints known as the Martyology of Angus, which claims that these sites are abandoned with the coming of Christianity in the 5th century AD. In the Irish mythological cycles, these sites are mostly frequent, take the form of grand residential halls, for the king, French kings of Ireland, often taken in form termed by J.P. Mallory as the standard Irish palace. In the story of uh, Recruit's Feast, for example, Queen Maeve's Hall at Rackrogan is described as a walled circular building split into seven ranks of circles of compartments centred around a roaring fire and supported by three great bronze posts. Alongside their claimed residential role, these sites are also various, variously named as gathering places, as the sites of the great pre-Christian festivals, and in the case of Rackrogan, as a cemetery of kings. In the medieval period, many kings would claim long-running associations with these sites, and often using them to stage their own royal inaugurations and gatherings, and constructing their own residence within their existing landscapes. Alongside this, we have also the ritual complex at the hill of Ishna, many of the features which date from prehistoric times. 
While this site is less associated with kingship in Irish mythology, it does play a major role as a central axis or middle of Ireland, and indeed is situated within only a few kilometres of its exact centre point. So how well does the description of these sites given in Irish mythology match with their known archaeology? Thanks to a number of excavations that were carried out in the second half of the 20th century, we now know that during the Iron Age these royal centres bore little resemblance to the grand halls and buildings so often described in these tales. Instead, the impression given by these sites is that they are functioned as large open-air complexes, the main features which appear to have had a ritual rather than domestic role. Each of these centres are based around major hilltops or plateaus, which feature commanding views of the surrounding landscapes, and are set within a large ritual complexes. While many of these sites are built around pre-existing monuments, some which date back as far as Neolithic, their peak usage appears to have taken place during the Iron Age, with many sites undergoing major remodelling, with the addition of a number of vast hinge-like enclosures. The result that in their final forms, these complexes often contain ritual features, dating from many different periods of prehistory, including passage tombs, earthen mounds and barrows, ditched and banked enclosures and processional routes. We will discuss these ritual features in more detail next video. For the moment, however, we can conclude that the general descriptions of these sites found within Irish mythology as domestic halls and residences do not match their known archaeology.